Hi, I'm Dr. Brian Shuck, director of the UCLA Kidney Cancer Program, and today I'm going to outline what to expect after a radical nephrectomy done either robotic or by a laparoscopic approach. Patients always ask us what to expect, and this video I think will be helpful whether you have surgery at UCLA or elsewhere. So a radical nephrectomy involves taking the whole entire kidney, including the tumor, together as one. 90% uh, of radical nephrectomies today can be done minimally invasively uh, when the tumor um, is generally localized to the kidney and not involving any other organs. Rarely do we need to do an open incision, and we do that when there's complex anatomy or potentially the tumor is involving another organ. Uh, minimally invasive surgery may include either laparoscopic, where the surgeon is holding the instruments, or robotic, where we give the instruments to the robot to hold and we do fine control. Now, most minimally invasive radical nephrectomies now employ a robotic system. It's nice and easy just to sit at this console over here and control this nice machine over here. Ergonomically, it's a lot easier. It's like playing a video game rather than holding the instruments. Robotic surgery does enhance a surgeon's uh, ability because instead of holding two instruments in a standing position, we potentially will be holding a third instrument and we can toggle between two different ones while the robot is holding all three instruments. Uh, and then magnification is also much uh, more detailed. It also can have a fine control where it can basically pare down uh, your, your movements. If your surgeon has decided a robotic-assisted radical nephrectomy is right for you, uh, this is a good video to discuss what to expect and the aftercare. So before surgery, it's important to understand things. There are medical complications that can happen with surgery. We want to lower those risks. So by seeing your primary doctor, you potentially can manage some of your medical issues, your blood pressure, maybe deal with things like your heart issues, and we can determine what's the best approach to minimize some of these medical issues if you're heading into surgery. Cardiac testing can be helpful. An EKG is a baseline test, but some patients need more extensive cardiac testing. Additionally, there could be specific medications like blood thinners, aspirin, or other things. Supplements will give you instructions to probably try to stop if possible before an operation. Now, also before surgery, your doctors and the anesthesia team might have instructions regarding stopping certain medications. Uh, again, like blood pressure and diabetes drugs, what to do the morning of surgery would be very helpful. And again, we don't want this to be guesswork the morning of surgery. We want you to be fully aware of what to do. We also may ask you to take clear liquids just to clean up your bowels. Uh, we want the bowels to be empty before we push them out of the way. And if you had maybe 64 hot dogs the day before and some contest, it's going to be maybe a little bit more challenging for us to have space to work and to move things out of the way. So we tell you to take clear liquids the whole day. We don't ask you to take a horrible bowel prep, which used to be done in the past. Additionally, at midnight, we tell a lot of patients not to eat or drink. We call that NPO status, other than maybe a sip of water with a medication if indicated. Now, preparing for surgery, I would tell all my patients you wouldn't run a marathon without any training, and the same applies here. If you're going to be having an operation, you're going to be booked four to six weeks maybe in the future. It often helps to increase your activity before surgery, which will help speed your recovery. And that would be maybe doing more walking, incre increase the frequency or duration uh, if you're already exercising. Um, additionally, having good nutrition helps you heal better, so if you're eating an unhealthy diet, try to make some lifestyle changes to help you heal quicker by taking, you know, a balanced meal of fruits and vegetables. Uh, finally, if you're a smoker, you're under general anesthesia for this type of operation. You'd be uh, advised to stop smoking or reduce your smoking. It'll help your lung recovery after an operation because you will be asleep on a ventilator and the anesthesiologist will be trying to give you oxygen, and the healthier your lungs are, the better you'll recover. Now, reducing weight, if your operation maybe is you know, several months off, uh, getting down in weight, 10, 20, 30 pounds losing weight is challenging, but it will give us more space to work, less fat around the kidney, maybe easier for us to place the instruments, and this can make all the difference in someone who's maybe morbidly obese. Uh, in the pre-op holding area, you arrive to the operation. We have you meet us, usually about two hours before the scheduled surgery. You'll meet various important members of the team. There's lots of checks and balances regarding the surgical plan, maybe some audibles, uh, maybe such as the need to make a larger incision. The team will mark the correct side. It's somewhat redundant, but we ask you many times for confirmation of the laterality. And then your family members can be with you in the holding area, maybe give you a kiss or hug on the way off to surgery. 
Now in the operating room, the operating room sometimes is a little bit cold, you'll be wheeled in there, and the staff in the OR suite will, will, will greet you. They'll get you to move from one bed to another. And after you fall asleep, you might have different lines or catheters placed for monitoring, including a, maybe a catheter in your bladder. Uh, the team will position you on your correct side to allow us to have access to that kidney, and you'll be then secured to the table. I tell everyone we make you earthquake proof just to make sure you're secured. We want to make sure there's no uh, uh, pressure points uh, that are uh, waking, you're waking up and you're in any discomfort. So we pad you very well to the table. And then we shave and sterilize the site. We give you antibiotics. We want to lower the risk of a surgical site infection. Now we usually, for laparoscopic or robotic cases, we fill your abdomen with gas. We use carbon dioxide. This gives us room to work. Uh, if we're going behind the abdominal cavity, sometimes we use a balloon to get access to that space. We put these hollow instruments in. These are trocars to allow us to put the surgical instruments in. Um, and these um, are, um, allow us to place also a camera inside the abdomen as well. For the ro robotic approach, the bedside assistant is usually there helping the robot. And again, the robot does not do the operation. We control the robot. It's not autonomous. We're uh, making movements alongside uh, uh, in the room, and the robot follows our movements. Now, these are some of the trocars. We put these inside. Uh, these are hollow and allow us to place instruments through them. And there's a picture of the robot over there being uh, wheeled in to attach to these small instruments. And this would be our assistant port with carbon dioxide gas allowing continual uh, inflow to keep the abdomen expanded. Uh, internally, the robotic and laparoscopic approach is the same operation as the old days when we used to make huge incisions. Uh, it does reduce incisional pain, it speeds recovery, it decreases bleeding. Uh, the carbon dioxide gas does give some bloating discomfort, so you trade long incisional pain, which can take weeks to recover, for usually very short-term bloating and uh, discomfort from all that gas. Sometimes that gas dis uh, can irritate the diaphragm and give you pain on the shoulder of the side you operated on. So if you ever wake up and you're in pain on that side, you don't think that maybe you pulled your, your, your shoulder, uh, it's us probably irritating your diaphragm. Pain is a normal part of the healing process. We tell patients to expect it. Expect the pain is part of your, your, your natural healing. Uh, we usually offer you narcotics, and most patients do take narcotics, but we want you to be weaned off those as quickly as possible. In some countries, like in, in Europe, they don't offer you narcotics, it's just Tylenol. Uh, if we do give you narcotics, we do rec recognize we want to get you off it as quickly as possible because they can be addicting and there is an opioid epidemic. Now, after surgery, patients will be transported uh, to a room for recovery. We tr encourage you to get out of bed very quickly, the first couple hours with the nurse. It takes some time to get your sea legs under you, as they say, uh, and every time out of bed will be easier. Uh, if post-operative nausea is present, we do want to kind of give you anti-nausea medications. We would generally slowly advance your diet initially to clears. We don't give you a sloppy joe right after recovery room because your bowels may not be ready for that. The lab, are, lab results are checked in recovery room and often the morning after, and that's all that's needed. And then if you have a catheter, that's removed you know, the next morning. 90% uh, of our patients can go home within 24 hours. However, sometimes patients with medical issues or those who are slow to reach our goals do need to stay a little bit longer. Patients do recover better at home where you're not bugged by the team checking in on you and you have all these monitors beeping. Uh, there's no strict dietary restrictions. We want you to stay hydrated and, and uh, try to eat healthy. Walking is encouraged. We will tell patients that go upstairs or downstairs slowly. You just cannot do any heavy exertion. You cannot ride your Peloton bike. You need to take it easy. Um, the wounds are usually left open to air, and we use skin glue, and this naturally will dissolve. Patients can drive when they are no longer in any pain. They are no longer drowsy, uh, and this sometimes uh, uh, is variable, but can take several weeks in some patients or several days in other patients. Uh, we want you to be off narcotics because these can make you drowsy and you can be, you know, get into an accident. Uh, we advise four to eight weeks uh, to ask off of work. Uh, some patients can return to work much quicker. Others may take more time depending on uh, your, your uh, level of, of um, your activity. 
Now, working through complications, complications can happen. They can happen to the best surgeon. Uh, the more you operate, the, the, the more you um, can see complications. Fortunately, they occur infrequently. Um, the first few weeks, sometimes these complications can occur in a delayed fashion. Some of these occur at home. You can have either high fevers or chills, nausea or vomiting. So you can have some constipation. You can have some wound bruising. When in doubt, call your doctor. Your doctor always is available either in his office or her office at night or potentially uh, through a paging system. You can get a hold of your, your doctor. He or she will be available to, be, uh, to help. The readmission rate is less than 3%. Um, it's lower than the national average here, even though we tackle very hard, uh, challenging cases. We don't send patients home unless we feel they're going to not bounce back to the hospital. Uh, seeing the doctor back, we recommend that a follow-up in two or three weeks to check on your status, to look at the incisions. If there are any issues, we want to have you come back sooner. You come with your pad and pencil uh, and then go over the pathology, understand the tumor's type, the size, the grade, what's your risk of recurrence, what's the follow-up plan needed, do you need any therapy to lower the risk of recurrence called adjuvant therapy. You get all that in your post-operative visit. Uh, if you're interested in coming to UCLA, we'd love to have you. Our kidney cancer program has been in, up and running for 30 years. Here's our information. If you want access to our extensive video library, we're always making new content. You hover over the QR code and can access some of these uh, videos. Uh, you can always, if you're interested in supporting more videos to be created, support our program here. We have an extensive research uh, program. You can hover over that QR code. Our website has lots of information on uclahealth.org with information on treatment and uh, other, other great content of other providers that are available. Thank you for your attention today. We look forward to helping you.